Thanks very much, uh, Martin, and uh, also Lisa, for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I must say that, uh, that the uh, true experts are really uh, Martin and uh, Lisa, Barry, of course, and Charles. Uh, I'm sort of, um, uh, I, I began in the nest of, of networks, but left it. Uh, fairly early on, although I maintained an interest and wrote a couple of things in relationship to it. So the invitation is really a chance uh, for me to talk about some of the early days uh, and also uh, also to come back to it, which I have been doing uh, rather uh, recently. Uh, what I have to say, I think, is, however, more of an off-key note address rather than a key note address. Um, but, um, <coughs> Uh, I'll see what I can do to talk about, first of all, some of the early days and some of the ideas that were behind Mitchell's interest, initial interest, uh, and then uh, to move into a discussion of how that stuff on networks, I think, uh, distinguishes itself, but also morphs a little into the kind of thing that uh, Bruno Latour has been talking about recently with actor network theory, and I will offer a slight critique, maybe of both positions, uh, and then finish up with, I'm afraid, indulging myself in a little bit of anthropology, uh, where I will talk about uh, the importance of value in the understanding uh, of network sets and relations and so forth. Uh, something which I think other people have been doing, but I'm also particularly interested in that. So I will talk and read at various, at various points uh, in the, in, in the uh, course of this presentation. Now there are marked similarities and differences between the idea of social network as introduced into anthropology and sociology in the 1950s and 60s by Elizabeth Bott, John Barnes, uh, and most notably by Clive Mitchell on the one hand, and that labelled actor network theory by Bruno Latour and John Law on the other hand. Marilyn Stathurn, incidentally, who was professor here for a while, uh, wrote uh, uh, an extremely interesting paper way back in 1996, I think, um, which recognizes some of the continuities between Latour uh, and the earlier social network approach of Clyde. Uh, and she has some very interesting suggestions about the nature of the structuring of relations in networks and how that relates to different forms of value, which I'll be coming back to later in this talk. <clears throat> she indicates points also of complementarity with which I'm broadly concerned here at least to start with, which has major methodological implications for the network fo focus either Michelian or Latourian. I should be clear from the outset uh, my orientation to networks is still that of a neophyte. This must be so for the field of network analysis as a whole, regardless of different perspectives within it, has expanded well beyond the state of the art when I participated in Mitchell's early developments of the approach in the 1960s. It is this initial focus uh, with which, uh, which I will revisit somewhat nostalgically. This is where some of the overlap between Mitchell and Latour is to be detected, as well as, uh, as perhaps the major distinctions and also what I consider to be some of the continuing difficulties. Mitchell's primary concern was to develop the concept of network into a tool for analysis so that it was neither simply a metaphor nor merely a methodological technical device. Indeed, he conceived of the idea of network as opening to new vistas of empirical and theoretical possibility that complemented prevailing, uh, prevailing sociological perspectives while breaking beyond their limitations and restrictions. Moreover, the concept of network, with its ego-centered emphasis, provided the opportunity of linking observations on the ground, the immediate material of sociological work, um, the, the, immediate, uh, the uh, material of uh, uh, sociological work was, in his view, based on the activity of individuals, with more abstract understandings 
and some removed from gritty ground level processes. The concept of social network was one which enabled the various levels of abstraction that are involved in sociological thinking and, un and understanding to connect up with the phenomena of concern at the grassroots. This did not involve the abandonment of the notion of the social or indeed of society and a variety of key analytical constructs, rather a concern with their concretization as well as, in addition, the discovery of other processes of social formation uh, and their effects, which a variety of dominant discourses, usually of an institutional or super-individual structural kind, largely ignored. Mitchell stressed that networks had structures, structures of relations, and these structures would work in the shaping uh, of action in ways just as potently, if not more so, than those forces hitherto connected with institutional orders and the principles addressed in relation to them. The state, the, eco the economic industrial order, class, ethnic and religious communalization and identity, the family, kinship, were all vital terms in sociological understanding. The idea of the social network for Mitchell was definitely not a concept to be added to the already and fast expanding battery of concepts at hand for sociological analysis, and it was by no means alternative to them. Thus, it was grasped as a concept that operated both vertically and laterally. That is, it tied higher levels of abstract conceptualization and description into the root empirical processes upon which they were designed to reflect. Perhaps more importantly, the concept cross-cut various analytical categories, class, ethnicity, etc., decentering them and breaking the confines or constraints of their boundaries. It is crucial to Mitchell's approach that the notion of social network did not necessarily replace routine conventional forms of sociological understanding. That is, he was against simply exchanging one set of terms with another, swapping one form of convention with something different but with similar effect. Since Mitchell wrote what appeared as a very minority interest as of course, as uh, we all know, has achieved dominant place. Those who were committed to institutional and system analyses were often highly critical of network analysis at the time Clyde was working. The, the times have changed. Networks are now the thing. We live in a global network, social world, which is expanding exponentially with innovations in digital technology. The network society is celebrated, but in certain respects, maybe little has changed. Thus, the network idea has literally supplanted the position of institutional analysis, and in some instances have repeated dimensions of that which network analysts uh, once complained about. For example, in the degree of its abstraction and separation from actual processes, and dependent on the perspective taken, the reduction of the consideration of institution, of institutional and other forces of a structural and cultural ideological kind that may be crucial to comprehending processes of a network sort. And in fact, the force of network processes. The idea of network has strong, at least imminently, ideological dimensions of its own that some proponents of the concept expressly attempt to avoid. Latour, for example, and as I will discuss, uh, he rejects what he labels as the sociological ideologists, largely the leftist critical sociology, to clear the way for his evidence-based, science-oriented sociology. He makes a kind of Heideggerian clearing, which is no less heavily laden with a particular ide ideological potential. This is also the case with Mitchell's and the so-called Manchester School of Anthropology, to, uh, and, and, and their turn specifically to network. The egocentricity of the concept, or perhaps better, the atomic basis of the concept in reference to which the relational structures of networks were variously defined. The approach to relations in the perspective had the potential of intensifying the tendency towards a very Eurocentric, modernist, postmodernist, individualist approach. The capacity was there for a denuding or emptying out of the practical logics inherent in the quality of certain relations. 
And furthermore, the flattening and homogenization of the ideologies and values implicated in them. In fact, there's a connection there uh, with Latour as well. But Latour is expressly concerned to do that, whereas <coughs> Mitchell was not. Mitchell, Mitchell was very much aware of this in the background to his own thought, although there were problematic contradictions in this from the very start. Here I want to consider that a little more. I stress that Mitchell's slant on networks grew from his experience as a field anthropologist. Here I am with sociologists, but I have to admit that I'm still an anthropologist. Uh, although I should emphasize, and I agree with Clyde, Clyde never wanted a really, he was unhappy with the split in the department, actually, and he always <coughs> considered uh, that sociology and anthropology were united. They were not distinct. Uh, uh, that in fact they, they had to sit together rather than divide. <coughs> so that I stress that uh, Clyde's interest in slant on networks grew from his experience actually as a field anthropologist working in a traditional society, the Yao people of Malawi, to be followed by his abiding interest in urban formations and the focus uh, they afforded upon highly heterogeneous and innovative social action. Working especially in the Zambian cock belt, Mitchell was interested in the different ways in which lives in contemporary urban industrial contexts took various trajectories. He attended to continuities and creative discontinuities. Urban spaces and the processes of urbanization gave rise to new forms of life, but this did not necessarily involve social breakdown. Mitchell was strongly influenced by Max Gluckman's situational analysis perspective. This stressed the heterogeneity of practices and their differential constitution according to diverse practical logics, often specific to context. Gluckman, in developing his situational analytical method, nonetheless cleaved to the powerful institutional Durkheimian sociology of the time and its dualist and oppositional mode of thinking. The concepts of organic and mechanical solidarity were utmost in his thought when he declared that urban practices in the mining towns of, Af of African migration in southern Africa could not be understood in terms of the context of the mechanical solidarity of African rural villages. <coughs> Mitchell was of the same broad opinion, on which basis he criticized adaptationist and evolutionist approaches to urbanization, especially common in anthropological approaches in North America. Such orientations often saw cities and, by extension, dynamics of industrializing and urbanizing social change as sites for the breakdown of pre-existing or traditional forms of relations. Mitchell was very early on extremely critical of such a perspective. For him, Robert Redfield's, for example, the folk urban continuum whereby the, mor whereby the moral small-scale rural traditional orders collapsed in the face of larger-scale urban industrial dom domains don't only miss the Durkheimian point that they were different forms of order or system, but refused the possibility that they could coexist and operate with a degree of complementarity, a point I'll come back to later, even though that complementarity is shifting. This was especially so in the Southern African context of the 1950s and the early 60s of Mitchell's ethnography, the colonial order of which encouraged a system of circular migration. The rural African migrants to the mining and other towns supported the life worlds of the villages of their origin, to which the migrants returned intimately during their working life and permanently at its end. Jaap van Wilson, for instance, another member of the early Manchester School and supervised by Mitchell as well as Gluckman, was to insist that the system of circular migration in southern Africa was thoroughly integral to the colonial order and its regulations inhibiting permanent African urban settlement. The maintenance of rural ties into the rural areas by African urban migrants and therefore the continual influence of rural institutions and urban contexts was a function of the overarching colonial order as a whole. Very much later, James Ferguson, for example, in Expectations of Modernity, uh, was effectively directed in 1989 uh, and still much quoted, was effectively to echo the same point although he was to stress the significance of the embracing global political economy whose uncertainties, reflected in the, whose uncertainties reflected in the failure of copper prices created greater rural dependency. 
This is manifested in the pattern of urban-rural interconnections, or in other words, the structure of social networks and their inner dynamic and flows. Such an understanding, of course, had already been pursued by Mitchell and by others in the original social network volume. I note specifically A.L. Epstein's republished article and that of the work of Harry Jones. Mitchell was to attack notions of irreversible linear change and approaches that were wedded to conceptions of change as necessarily transformational from one kind of systemic or structural mode of life to another, from community to association, for example. The African urban systems that he studied indicated heterogeneous or multiple possibilities governed by situated logics that were not to be essentially reduced to an overarching urban order or system. These situated logics, logics of practice, were born out of the problematics of existence constituted out of specific contexts of action, both in urban space and also transcending or cross-cutting conventional rural-urban divides, for instance. I note at this point that Mitchell was effectively contesting overall assumptions of change that, for example, modernity had a particular shape or inexorable direction of the Durkheimian kind, or of others, such as that of Ferdinand Turney's, a shift from community to association. Mitchell had a strong sense for the innovative, as his classical study, The Kalela Dance, shows, and, what, and, and that what is conceived as change had many different potential trajectories and did not have an inexorable, determinate course of the kind, for example, that urban Africans would necessarily follow the European evolutionist course or the program that colonialism was trying to set for them. There was a Latourian intimation in Mitchell's orientation, uh, I'm suggesting. It also has implications for thinking about conventional terms like we now live in a network society and it's very different from when we didn't have computers and so forth. This is uh, set up as rather problematic, I think, which I will talk about a bit later. Mitchell, pursuing Gluckman's situational idea that in numerous ways had its roots in Evans Pritchard's classic newer studies, was moving outside conventional institutional analyses in his urban work. It was a potential of Gluckman, but one from which Gluckman retreated. Mitchell's urban research and his emphasis on continuities and change was in fact open to the network idea. That's why he's fascinated when you hear him talking on the, on, on the film. That's why he's fascinated by listening to John Barnes and talking, and, 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 uh, and, and talking about uh, that kind of way of tracing up relations. His interest, his interest in the network idea, I see it, is, is, uh, is, is really important for a number of reasons. Methodological, uh, methodologically, networks was an idea that further facilitated an anthropology of complexity urban processes being one site for complexity, complexity though in the view of the Manchester anthropology sociology of the time was a property of any social process and certainly not to be marked as the property of modernity necessarily or of contemporary industrial or post-industrial societies. This I stress was already the point of situational analysis. You can't understand Clyde on networks unless you understand situ situational analysis. It's situational analysis that brought him into contact with people like Goffman and Ansel Strauss that was, he was influenced, as I was and many others, by this guy sitting on my left uh, with ethnomethodology and so forth, which is also uh, something which I know Latour is interested in. So there's little background connections that we shouldn't uh, really forget about. Um, <clears throat> anthropology conventionally focused on the small scale, on the face-to-face, -face, on, on that which could be directly ob observed. Situational analysis was thoroughly concerned with extending the anthropological method based on the small scale and the immediately observed into the examination of processes in contexts of industrialized, uh, industrializing or globalizing <coughs> complexity. Another reason for looking at the connection in, 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 in Mitchell's thought uh, how he gets from situational analysis into networks. Networks extends further what he was working or thinking about in situational analysis. The idea of social network was another way in which the anthropology of complexity could be conducted and the value of an anthropological perspective realized. 
This is all the more so because the network idea initially stressed the critical importance of social relations and the quality and structure of relations. Here it might be seen that the traditional anthropological interest in kinship relations is not unre unrelated to an interest in social networks. <clears throat> I'm talking about relations because this is the, the big emphasis in, in modern network analysis uh, and it's that which was there at the beginning and to some, but I'm going to also talk about how it was to some extent also subverted. Anyhow, there is no accident that one of the major innovators of the social network idea is Elizabeth Parker. <coughs> her approach was bolstered by her interest in psychoanalysis and her orientation accordingly concentrated on the qualitative dynamic of relations. The alacrity with which anthropologists took to the network idea should not be overlooked, including by Raymond Firth, Siegfried Nardell, Adrian Mayer, etc. Mayer, extending on Firth, was to develop the notion of action sets, a more dynamic notion of the network idea, and made particularly relevant to examining, to examining the complexity of caste hierarchies and the potency of ties that overcame caste barriers in the organisation of political events. John Barnes took up the idea of networks in the context of Norway, which to him seemed to be devoid of the institutional and residential densities upon which ordinary sociological analysis depends. There's really no uh, Norwegian word uh, for urban settlement or town. They, they go from big cities to homesteads. And it was a homestead type of uh, society that John Barnes encountered in Bremnes and in Norway. Uh, <coughs> the, the concept of the social uh, uh, network was a way of realizing the social, objectifying it, as it were, and opening it to analysis a way of seeing the social where it didn't appear to be existing and to realise the social that was somehow being ignored by certain types of institutional perspective. Moreover, the social network concept, by focusing on concrete connections and relations, reveals social processes that either did not fit erstwhile conventional formal categories of sociological analysis or else were in fact positively obscured by them. Social dynamics were revealed through the network concept that had theoretical potentially that had theoretical potential force beyond or outside contemporary formal analytic categories. Mitchell was impressed with Philip Meyer's reference to networks in the study of the different responses of Africans to urban uh, to urban living in East London, South Africa. In fact, as you get a, you get a competitive sense when you listen when you look at uh, uh, Clive's. Uh, film, he felt that he'd been pivoted at the post by, uh, by, by uh, Philip Mayer. He felt that Philip Mayer had really stolen the march on him. <coughs> uh, anyhow, Mayer's approach uh, showed how network relational structures described to the network relevant concepts of density and closure accounted for the creation and persistence of traditional value that of the red quarter across the urban-rural divide of, convention, of, 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 of conventional sociology. Such values conflicted with a stress on modernity or globalising value within the closer population and the development of a form of life objected by the closer themselves as school. School closer evidenced a distinct network structure, open and loose-knit. In Granovetter's now famous terms, of, uh, terms the structure of school closer networks demonstrated the strength of weak ties, open to innovative ideas and practice of a globally modern sort, that the strong ties of the Red School resisted. Or that the, uh, uh, the Red Plaza resisted. Further, what I think interested Mitchell was that the structure of network relations did not merely correlate with particular forms of action, but had creative institutionalizing effect. That is, they gave rise to innovative ideological potential coupled with the capacity to institutionally realise such potential, to create new forms of institution. Also, in a sense, the thing that was fascinating him about Elizabeth Bott's initiative. Mitchell's push on the network idea might be conceived of as an event in the Deleuzean sense that had many potential trajectories. The one I have been discussing was one. It gave an anthropological emphasis to the notion of value 
and that all or any social relations are imbued with value and as well are vital in the which in, in, as well is vital in, in, in the reproduction of relations and the generation of new value. Added to this, of course, is the notion that the concept of network was a dynamic one. It was in itself a process having to do with the continual structuring or restructuring of relations as a function of the actions of the members of the network. In association with this, there was a strongly implicit concern with how network relations and the overall structural form of the network placed constraints on action or else facilitated it. This is so in and through value and the production of value and is not independently of value. The critical point that extends from this observation is that the import, meaning and effect of network structure, network relations, patterns of connectivity, etc., cannot be conceived independently of values that they embed or come to embed and their positioning within larger ideological forces. Nonetheless, Mitchell's network direction and also Latour's actor-network approach, at least in its initial uh, formulations, he's continually rethinking his thought, by the way, uh, uh, <coughs> tended to overstress pattern and structure at the expense of value. Mitchell's network perspective was powerfully sociocentric, it, yet it rested on individualist and atomistic assertions and assumptions that were subversive of some of its own objectives. It embedded or was open to, open to value assumptions of a strongly ideological kind. What Louis Dumont, for example, and others such as McPherson described as the individualist value or possessive individualism integral to much Euro-American political and social thought and also analysis. The early days of Mitchell's network intervention were very much influenced by developments in the social psychology of small groups and the study of communication nets. Kurt Levine's work, for example, had been influential on the work of another well-known Manchester person, uh, uh, Victor Turner, uh, uh, as also, I think, Max Gluckman and others at Manchester. The concept of field, well before uh, uh, Bourdieu, incidentally, uh, was uh, and, and, and relevant to network analysis, had some of its genesis both at Manchester uh, and in their reading uh, of Levine. My own silver room study had been influenced by reading social psychologists on communicative processes. Of course, it's obvious. Social psychology has a strong individualist tendency, and this potential was exacerbated in the sociological theories that many of us were interested in at the time. Examples were the anthropologist Frederick Barth's exchange theory and the very similar perspectives developed by Homans and by Peter Blau. The primacy given to such approaches in the development of the network perspective not only subordinated understanding to a particular form of value, one that was far from culture or ideologically free, it, reduced or, it also re reduced or edged out the consideration of other forms of value. Network analysis was becoming perhaps universalist in theoretical claim and in, in, in what it embedded far too soon. Latour and Law's actor-network approach is explicitly anti-sociocentric as it is anti-socially constructivist. As an, initial, as an initial strategy, it aims to exclude ideology and value, although, as I've said, it is atomistic in emphasis with a concern with the formation of relations, but in a very different sense from that of Mitchell. Latour presents himself as a scientific realist, oriented to suspend value radically in the perhaps laudable effort to, ex to, to expunge prejudgments present in the philosophies and theories concerning the orientations of human being and its social nature. He positively references ethnomethodology. I'm interested to know what Wirtz has to say with, with that. Not only do regnant social and psychological theories beg the question of human nature and the orders and processes of human society, they asserted too easily the uniqueness of human being and a la Durkheim of the rules, the uniqueness of its creation society. Society and the social and humanity were not essentially or necessarily to be conceived as conditioned by laws or processes peculiar to themselves. Latour refuses the sociological metaphysics of the past leading through the European Enlightenment and is committed, far from unproblematically so, to, to a vision of science that he sees as having broken free from early uh, metaphysical moorings. 
His vision is a post-structuralist or post-humanist understanding of science, one of this powerfully Deleuzean in ambience that sees in the metaphysics of the past, particularly the works of Europe of Enlightenment philosophers, the germs of an expanding scientific understanding of material forces that overthrow previous dominant assumptions uh, uh, and assertions. Latour's actor network theory celebrates the intentionality of things, objects, and structures outside that of human being, and stresses the enmeshment of human action in assemblages or complex inter-networked arrangements cross crossing different modalities of existence that engage dynamics that are quite independent of human consciousness, and that have effects on human consciousness. The approach theoretically allows for the discovery of the particular forces of value, non-human as well as human, without prejudging what kind of values may be at work. Even though Latour allows for the importance of value, however this is to be defined, this is nonetheless reduced in his work. This is, this is facilitated, I think, paradoxically, in Latour's particular decentering uh, of both the human and of society into the dynamics of social constructivism. Such, I think, is compounded by his overvaluation of science and scientific observation as operating independently of value. I comment at this point that although Mitchell's and Latour's approaches are distinct, Latour has sought much of that to which Mitchell was committed. They share, nonetheless, a commitment to science. Mitchell saw mathematics as holding out a distinct possibility for the development of sociology as a truly scientific discipline. The idea of social network opened for Mitchell the potential for the achievement of a synthesis between observational quantitative work, which he insisted was thoroughly scientific in itself. Uh, Latour uh, undoubtedly would agree. Anthropology and its fieldwork idea was initiated to a large extent by anthropologists, of course, uh, who, who were committed to science. Uh, Malinowski and Franz Boas, for example, were trained physicists. The findings of such fieldwork for Mitchell could be integrated with mathematical and statistical perspectives and techniques, each expanding their potential through the, through the other. This was the idea. In Mitchell's notion of the social network, uh, uh, recited the opportunity to realize the benefits of two distinct scientific approaches and to place them into, into, into complementary relation. Uh, the observational and the experiential at one point and the, the uh, more abstract conceptual mathematical one. Mitchell's great concern to develop mathematical techniques, I must emphasize that the, the fieldwork was not of the, of the sort of social survey kind in, 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 in Mitchell's notion. He emphasized the anthropological position of the experiential. The uh, Mitchell's great concern to develop mathematical techniques of network analysis was always in the effort to incorporate observed material and to extend the possibilities of its interpretation. In my early years of participation with him in his network enthusiasm, I well remember both his hunger for empirical material on lived situations and his objective to see if other insights could be derived from it through varieties of mathematical analysis. Both he and Kingsley Garber, a name not mentioned much, uh, 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 in fact experimented very, very strongly with, uh, with graph theory, but things have since, of course, gone well beyond that. But the synthesis of the observational and mathematical is still a way off. Although major efforts to achieve this are apparent, many of the people working in that direction are here. I suggest that in some ways, the undoubted advances the, on the mathematical side of the network approach has outweighed the observational side. This, in turn, has accentuated the inattention to value and facilitated forms of abstraction or removal from the ground of action that was the initial aim of network analysis to address. To summarize, Mitchell and Latour have very different approaches. Mitchell would have seen Latour's argument as mere metaphor and, his term, and in his terms, unscientific. Latour would have seen Mitchell's position as possibly accentuating the difficulties of socio-centrism to which he is opposed. In certain ways, as I see it, the development of the mathematical directions in network analysis that was Mitchell's direction has broken well beyond the boundaries of socio-centrism. Network analysis had been going in Latour's direction quite regardless of Latour. It is perhaps intrinsic to the nature of mathematics itself. I think of Elisa Bellotti's stuff that I've recently read which certainly indicates that, and others in the room. But my broader point 
is that for distinct reasons, the two approaches have undervalued the importance of value, or in particular instances, the relative, the, the, the relative lack of a critical examination of value assumptions guiding analysis. To some extent, that this has also involved a neglect of the institutional dimensions of human practices in the, in the, in the, in the, in the bid to sort of break out cycle. Perhaps this is a problem with their atomism, often highly reductive. Latour presents an entirely distinct genealogy for his actor network approach from that of Mitchell. He dismisses the anthropological and sociological heritage of Durkheim and Morse in preference for Gabriel Tard, whom the former disparaged. The emphasis is upon the elements from out of which the heterogeneous and shifting structural forms are continually becoming assembled and reassembled. The stress is on emergence something that Mitchell was interested in, but which did not require a total metaphysical overhaul in his case, and multiplicity along Deleuzean and Bergsonian lines. Following Deleuze, the tour's orientation is rhizomic, a completely decentered and decentering perspective. And on the surface, it would seem entirely appropriate, not just to Latour, but also to Mitchell also. There's something there which is very relevant for network analysis generally. But Deleuze did not exclude the institution. Uh, if distinct, it is nonetheless strongly implicated in his notion of the tree and the hierarchy. It's how the rhizome, uh, the, the sort of extra institutional, extra order processes, uh, are intertwining with tree-like, arboreal, centered processes that is, vital, that is a vital line of Deleuze's approach. It is the atomistic and rhizomic emphasis of Latour and some of his followers, and to the atomistic starting point of Mitchell that may exacerbate the inattention to value in the two approaches. Manuel de, Manuel de Landa, whose perspective is similar to Latour's in its social realism and anti-constructivism, exemplifies the risks of an atomistic orientation despite a concern to, to avoid reductionism. De Landa's universal objective refuses a concern with value at some cost and compounds the difficulty of his atomism. He refuses the possibility that the values that are built willy-nilly into his model may be critical for the, for, for the potency of the very organizational assemblages with which he is concerned. He states, I note, that his approach, I quote him, starting at the personal and even subpersonal scale, climbs up one scale at a time, all the way to territorial states and beyond. The lander openly admits no effort to take cultural values into account in his scheme, asserting his belief to quote that some of the properties of social assemblages, such as interpersonal networks or institutional organizations, remain approximately invariant across different cultures. To me, this is, this is quite an extraordinary statement. The lander and the tour are concerned with the universal potentializing... Move over of, one chair. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I will do that. Uh, Latour's actor network orientation, uh, uh, as the landers, is not limited to contemporary Euro-American systems. Latour especially asserts it, uh, its significance as a form of understanding that is, that is valid regardless of time and place. That is, the idea of social network is not important because we are now in a globalized networking society as the kind that scholars such as Castells have stressed. Network approaches are not key because we are in a modern digitalizing era in which networks are the major descriptive metaphor. Latour and also Mitchell conceived of networks as a new and important way to examine the processes in which humanity is continually realizing itself and its projects in the heterogeneous context and situations of human activity wherever and whenever. The idea of social network, therefore, is not relevant merely because it is a dominant metaphor in largely Western-defined modernities, but has general sociological significance. If it is to achieve this, then, I consider that the uh, uh, issue of value as well as institutional dynamics needs to be carefully addressed in network analysis. Now I'll make a big, having said all that, hot air bluster, I'm going to move uh, now, very quickly, to illustrate some of these points, if you can bear with me, um, uh, to India and attempt to bring Latour and Mitchell together in relation to processes that appear very traditional, but of course, a thoroughly modern. Uh, I have uh, 
just referred uh, to, to Deleuze's concepts of the tree and the rhizome. If I can have my, photo, my first two photographs, uh, I can show you something, uh, just to give you a quick image. That is a, a major deity in a place like Pukata, uh called Bhagavati, a form of Kali. She is the totality. She is, in a sense, the ordered center of all forms of, uh, of, 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 of social existence. She is the tree, in fact, in, in a Deleuzean sense, thoroughly materialized in symbolic form. Now the next one. Uh, this is a guy called uh, Mutapan, a form of uh, the mendicant, if I can call, call it that way, Shiva. Uh, uh, you haven't, I can't see it very clearly yet, but his headdress is full of uh, herbs and uh, grasses and various sorts of things. He's a, he's a rhizomic figure, actually, and indeed, he's been invented in fairly recent years uh, in Kerala, the place I'll be talking about, uh, uh, and is part and, and accompanies people who are on migration, uh, going to the cities. He protects uh, uh, shops and businesses, uh, and he protects, he protects persons in the fragility of the new relationships in which they enter into. He's in fact a symbolic form of the riser and is in relationship to uh, the figure of Bhagavati or Kali. Both these, these, these people, uh, I say, uh, are actually um, <coughs> forms of uh, deity called Tam. T-E-Y-Y-A-M means deity, uh, and uh, 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 they are at the center of complex ritual practices which uh, go throughout uh, the northern part of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Kerala, involving and, and over into Karnataka, involving 25 to 30 million people. They're not small events. <coughs> so let me, if I can hang with me for a bit longer, let me uh, just give you a bit of ethnography and move into the value stuff and consider a bit of that and then I'll shut up. Okay. Uh, I've been recently working on ritual materials in northern Malabar in the state of Kerala, India. This is a relatively poor area, the region politically dominated by Naya communities noted for their matrilineal kinship practices in, in a larger cultural field involving other castes and ethnicities, often Muslim, many of whom are also matrilineal. The, near, the Naya, actually a classic uh, society, first studied in uh, the early part of the last century, uh, and very important for the development of uh, anthropological work generally. Uh, the Naya, however, are a classic example of a particular extreme matrilineal system which gained significance in India-wide terms, which is largely uh, a system which, of kinship relations which are predominantly patrilineal. There are many different Naya communities or subcasts, and these are arranged in a hierarchical order in terms of the ritually mediated values of purity and pollution. There is such ritual value in this hierarchical system. Hierarchy, incidentally, is a term which is necessarily, in, in my usage, is not to be reduced to the socio-economic and political uh, terms of hierarchy in Euro-American conceptualization. And, for re and relevant, for example, to understanding systems uh, of class and stratification. But as a ritual system, hierarchy is a ritual system based on the dynamic of the relation between purity and pollution uh, is nonetheless significant in terms of its political and economic effects. If I was to take a longer period, I would say that what is very interesting about India, which has had very little historically uh, powerful uh, state formation, it's been able to, in fact, organize large sets of people and to determine their economy and, and polity just in terms of relations and in terms of this ritual structure uh, of uh, purity and pollution. It's that which even resists Marxist efforts by the central governments to, in fact, uh, kill off various kinds of caste prejudice. Another question. The marked resilience of religious and ritual value in, in India, a factor that is deeply embedded in everyday social interaction and reproduced through it, uh, may partly account for the resilience of, of, of religious and ritual forms. 
It might be suggested that such value generates particular kinds of what might be described as network patterns of varying degrees of openness and closure uh, of density, etc., and of course particular import to kinds of interconnection and rhizomic extension which maintain relevance uh, in and because of globalizing circumstances. Kinship value and especially that revolving around matrilineality are crucial uh, in the ranking of Naya within caste communities uh, and uh, in their connections into other communities outside them. Kinship value defines the intense course of densely knit communities of association and shared identity and other qualities of relation, social distance, status and rank, for example, danger and threat, into, uh, brought about by the incorporation of kinship and uh, dense communities into wider embracing social and political realities. Historically, the Naya communities were famous for being organized in dense settlements of co-residential kin linked to each other through a common female ancestress. These were known as Tarabads. The Tarabads were the primary property owning and political units, a dense close-knit core, relations through males or of, an, or of an affinal kind through marriage were undervalued, even negatively valued, that is, seen as potentially threatening uh, the reproductive and general coherence of the matrilineal core, core while being necessary to the reproduction of that core. Indeed, there were effectively two kinds of marriage traditionally in, uh, in, in Northern Kerala, one known as Tali marriage and the other uh, what I refer to as procreative marriage or Sambandha. In the past, Tali marriages, described by British colonials as child marriages, occurred before puberty and missionaries and colonial authorities were absolutely scandalised by them. These marriages were not sexual unions, but, ty but typically between close, matrilineally related kin. Effectively, a Tali marriage wedded the girl back into the group of those close matrilineal kin into which she'd been born, back into the Taraband, in fact. The girls are at the reproductive heart of a dense set of matrilineally connected kin and vital to the continuity of these kin and their command over economic and political resources. It is the Tali marriage that converts the rights of close matrilineal sets of kin over the children of their daughters. It asserts the value of the matric kin, the import of their relations over other relations in the general environment of their acting. The partner to a Tali marriage is a symbolic partner and took no further immediate role in the girl's life. This is because the marriage was not a conjugal union. It, it was simply a union of the girl back into uh, the matrilineage and everything that she might bring with her. Following the Tali ceremony and upon reaching maturity, the girl was free to enter sexual reproductive unions that conferred few rights except a conjugal on her partner or husband. And there were and girls at the, in the colonial period had multiple husbands, multiple marriages, something which offended uh, the British as well. Under colonial rule, both the institution of the Taraban, the basic lineage-based uh, co-residence and property holding unit of Nayar communities was disbanded and colonial laws were passed against the system of Tali marriage. It was considered to be immoral. Indeed, these institutions, in their traditional historical form, to all intents and purposes, became a thing of the past. The attack on the Taravad and the Tali was a modernizing project as far as colonialism was concerned. Indeed, with some globalizing effect, it was conceived as breaking the constraints of the Taravad and of tradition. This was, uh, this was important for another reason. Uh, some of you might know a bit of colonial history that uh, the British had a big problem with a, a Muslim uh, uh, uprising led by a guy called Tipu Tip. Uh, and uh, it was the Naya groups that were used uh, by the British to put this M M Muslim insurgency down. Now those Naya groups were matrilineal groups and, mili and militaristic. And the British had an interest in getting rid of this, not just for modernizing reasons, but to protect themselves against the possible insurgency by a newer, by a Naya um, uh, communities. Both the Tali marriage and the Taravad were close linked 
one integral to the reproduction of the other. Emphasize that the Tarada just wasn't a family. It was a collection of, ta of, 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 of families and small lineages into big regions of, of co-residence. Um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, this tight interrelation between uh, Tali marriage and the Taravan was expressed in the religious and ritual worship of the goddess Bhagavati who you've seen. Who you, who you seen. There are numerous temples and shrines to different forms of Bhagavati and Malabar and they tend to define distinct Naya communities and their hierarchical relation to each other. The Bhagavati temples and shrines um, uh, uh, I, 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 and, and, and these shrines are situated within kin and lineage based communities composing particular Naya castes uh, are the locations of major rites known as Tayam rites during which an assembly of gods will appear organised around specific Bhagavatis. A network diagram of the temples and shrines and the location of Tayam rites during the major ritual period in Malabar lasting approximately six months every year would effectively trace out the pattern of caste and lineage territories and the dynamics of their interrelation. I've done that, but I haven't got it to present. Very interesting. What I draw attention to is that despite the dissolution of the Taliban and what appeared to be the disappearance of the Tali institution as a function of legal regulations and prescriptions and other modernizing programs, the religious and ritual system nonetheless continued key values underpinning Naya caste and lineage relations. This was achieved through ritual pra practices. What might uh, appear as a process of modernizing secularization gave impetus to ritual practices, not as an insistence on tradition against modernity, but as a very force in modernity, empowering Taravatic value, as it were, in globalizing processes. What I'm suggesting is that this system of value continued, uh, was, as I will, will explain quickly, was, uh, was reinvented and is the engine not only in organising network relations within, uh, within uh, Kerala, but connections into the Gulf, where many of these people are going as migrants, and into uh, also North America uh, and Europe. Uh, I had the occasion once of sitting in one of these rites, and next to me was a guy in a dhoti, and we got talking, and it eventually turned out that he was head of the Harvard Medical School. Okay. But he was turning up at this particular event, which he meant to regularly. The vital rights of the Taravad are known as Tayam, and specifically the major large-scale ones held for a number of interrelated uh, matter lineages give ritual expression to the crucial values of the Tayam. Tayam rites take place at the central shrines of matter lineages or interconnected sets of matter lineages. The Taravad continues in the form of rite, if no longer built, therefore, uh, if, if no longer as a built residential form as it did in the past. If the Taravad might be conceived as, ent as, uh, as entering a virtual ritual symbolic space, it is also, I note, entered cyberspace. Tayam and the Taravad have, in a sense, been digitalized and vital in digital networking sites, especially on Orkut and also on Facebook. If you go into, if you go into Tayam on your, on your internet, you'll see that there's a lot of stuff on it and that all these are connecting up, if you like, uh, into... Uh, into this sort of stuff. It's all about the Taravad and about the matrilineal uh, connection and about these kinds of values. The major large-scale Tayam rites, performed on average in a cycle of 10 years or so, every 10 years or so, are occasions for the collective marriage now of prepubescent girls from the various interconnected lineages that attend the rites and define their mutual identity in relation to the shrines. The girls are effectively married to the shrine and thus the matrilineages that cluster around it. In this collective marriage, the girls are in essence forms of the goddess Bhagavati herself and, their, uh, and, are, the and are signed as the regenerative potency of the community as a whole. The practices that I refer to are not simply a continuity from the past into the pre pre present. They are thoroughly modern rites. That is, they are reproduced and expanded in the dynamic of the contemporary situation, engaging the digital universe to their production. Malabar, as I've said, is relatively impoverished, but now I have sought employment in the towns and cities throughout the state of Kerala and elsewhere in India and overseas. It is from Malabar that there is a major migration into the employment opportunities in the oil states of the Gulf. 
globalizing forces have threatened the political and economic integrity of local communities. This, as I indicate, took a particular turn under colonialism, expanding since independence. The attack on Natalia and the Taravad can be understood as a weakening the internal ties of community, what in network terms would be described as a dense, highly interconnected set of relations at the expense of relations with the outside. The conjugal union was valued over the union with the matrilineage. <laughs> The importance of external links through conjugal ties and other ties into the external world outside the matrilineage in general was a powerful fragmenting factor of local communities. Involvement in labour markets beyond the caste and lineage communities <coughs> withdrew resources affecting their continuity. But this is not a one-way process. The sentiments connecting persons to community cannot easily be severed, notwithstanding the fact that community identity and membership is a factor mediating persons into the wider political and economic field. There is a positive urgency, even when working at great distance from what is regarded as one's home location, to maintain connection into home communities, and this is done at the Bhagawati shrines. This is especially the case with labour migrants to the Gulf states, who might be considered as circulatory migrants in the Southern African sense of Mitchell's African Commonwealth Studies, uh, who work on limited contracts. So, uh, let me just uh, uh, go on. I mean, uh, uh, what I'm suggesting is that the values continued and then they actually produced an explosion uh, of new forms of ritual activity which further reinforced the development and extension uh, of networks uh, and the accumulation of wealth to some extent and also political power. Uh, so that, in a sense, to understand the formation of social relations, uh, the links of them, uh, the, the, the nature of the power of, for example, uh, thinly stranded relationships as against dense relationships, you have to, in fact, have a look at this whole uh, discourse of matrilineality which is centered within uh, the ritual universe and which uh, is expanding and continually changing uh, the nature of uh, social relations. If you have a look at a, at a couple of slides, I can cut things down a bit and show you something a bit more of what I'm really trying to talk about. Can I have, uh, there, there's a couple of, there's a shrine for one of the uh, major rites. We have the next one. Here are the Tali girls being presented. Uh, they're presented uh, by uh, their fathers who are in an affine, in an affinal relationship uh, to the matrilineage. Uh, and in uh, a lot of conceptions, uh, when a woman gets married, uh, her commitment to the husband in the modern context threatens the interests of the matrilineage uh, in terms of access to economic resources and political power. But what they do is they reincorporate, in a sense, uh, uh, the men that have uh, married the daughters of the matrilineage into the matrilineage through this ritual practice. They, in fact, convert uh, affines into consanguines. They create uh, uh, an actual kinship relationship which bonds these people in weakly stranded relationships into the uh, 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 matrilineage. They convert it into uh, a strong relationship. Next one, please. Uh, if you look at this one, I'd like to, I can't really blow it up, but if you were thinking in, in network terms on this, uh, here's a, a, you know, a, a population of some 400 or so attending this, this, this event. And if you look closely, uh, uh, you'll see various interesting things. Uh, here are uh, the, the um, uh, fathers uh, with their daughters, and the daughters are riding on their shoulders. Symbolically, uh, in fact, the daughter is giving birth to the father. Okay? rebirthing him within the structure of the, of the uh, uh, matrilineage and the actual group of them is, re is the, the outside, if I can put it that way, is located closely uh, to the central shrine. Around it you see different gatherings of people, of different caste, different uh, relational value and so forth. So there's a whole uh, set of uh, network relationships, different degrees of density, uh, different uh, degrees of relation and distance and so forth being expressed even in the spatial organization uh, of, the, 
uh, arrangement there. So, uh, <clears throat> all, all I'm trying to get at is that the, the, you know, we can understand these connections and these relations. If you don't have a sense of, of, the, of matrilineal value in this situation, you'd be at a loss about how to, in fact, analyze these things. Uh, <clears throat> Overall, the actions centered on the shrines give expression to the forces underpinning the assemblage and patterning of socio-political and economic relations in the overall field of close-knit matrilineal communities. Matrilineal value and the factors that may threaten it is given key import, indicative of its force in the shaping and reshaping of the complexity of social relations in a continually changing contemporary situation. And the values themselves are changing pretty uh, rapidly as well at the same time. I might mention that what I have presented has powerful institutional centered dimensions. We've got the Bhagavati is a, is a, center, it's a, it's a centering process uh, and, uh, and it's operating in relationship to rhizomy processes of the mutapan kind that I talked about at the very, uh, uh, at the very beginning. To put my general point, there may be relatively universal shapes in network structure, but the import of these structures vary according to the values that are inscribed in them and which are implicated in the motivations of their formation. I could make many other examples. Take ISIS, for example, the Islamic, uh, the Islamic Caliphate. Uh, 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 a, a, a diversity of different forms of network embedding uh, different values seem to be at work. Youths from the Islamic communities in Euro-American contexts whose commitments and the nature of their ties are constituted in Euro-American political and social realities are brought into relation with other structures of relations, dense ties based in tribal loyalties, for example, that express other values and dynamics. And I'm suggesting that these different values may in fact be working uh, against each other. One way, in fact, to get uh, the tribal values to get uh, to uh, work as a coherent force in network relations is, in fact, to establish a strong military opposition, such as the, uh, such as the West has done to uh, to these systems. If they were less aggressive, maybe uh, another logic would come into operation—a tribal logic, which would uh, break up the, the uh, tendency for these things to form uh, close-knit, uh, strongly organized uh, types of organization. The potency of the caliphate, I can only surmise, interconnects a diversity of ties, maybe of similar density, but embedding very different value in the dynamics of their structuration. Comprehending the caliphate is a complex assemblage of network relations of significantly differentiated value, rather than as a discrete, coherent, bounded order in terms of a Euro-American ideology of the nation-state, for example, is vital to interpreting and understanding the processes of work. So to conclude, I presented some of the ideas that were involved in the very early days in the formation of the social network idea. It began at a point when sociology and anthropology were united. Perhaps this was the distinction of Manchester as it was then. Something which distinguished Manchester from the development of either anthropology or sociology, elsewhere in Britain at least. Such a unity was embodied in Mitchell's perspective and in some ways, if very differently, is manifested in the actor network approach of the tour. I have indicated that what I see as some of the difficulties in the two approaches. The undervaluing of value is one, and or the subsumption of different values under the sign of a particularly dominant Western value, even unwittingly, that might limit the very great potential of network perspectives. I've tried to bring Mitchell together with Latour and indicate some of the ways they can be mutually informative while acknowledging their distinct genealogical trajectories. That's it.